we have started this, we've been discussing architecture in Asia. And what we've been discussing is traditional architecture. You, it's obvious that we're not dealing with colonial and we're not dealing with international influences. Uh, so those are two uh, things that are, are, mi are missing and we don't have time in this course to deal with them. But there is a third thing that is missing which we could try and fix and that is the issue of the association of buildings with each other. We've done individual buildings, but how do buildings form conurbations in towns and cities? And indeed, how are towns and cities conceived and then, of course, eventually designed from scratch by architects? So I think that is quite important. We've perhaps touched on it in China and Japan, but now I want to go back to the basic approach to these things, just as I did in talking about determinism in uh, architecture and then went on to Islamic architecture, showing how much of it was based on the determinist traditions. So now I want to go to do the same thing with towns. <coughs> of course, the oldest cities in the world are those in Mesopotamia, 3200 BC. They're not the oldest towns. Those go back another 3,000 years. Uh, but cities have certain characteristics uh, which we can see here. They tend to be very tight-knit. They tend to have uh, defensive uh, uh, perimeters. There's also usually some great focus of activity in the city, such as a religious center and that would be associated with the uh, area for the ruler and his associates to live and work. And then there would be the market, nearly always quite close to the center as well. <coughs> so here is an ancient Mesopotamian town, and you can see these characteristics. It's clear that you can see the defensive works, and you can see the central area of administration and of prayer for religious purpose. And uh, although it's not clear, the market is next to that. <coughs> so we're going to start by looking at that kind of tradition. These ancient towns in Mesopotamia have often been excavated. And so here is ancient Ur and a detailed study of all the houses in relation to the streets. The houses very tightly packed together but what I wanted to point out was the way in which the houses related to the streets. Most of the houses are approached from side streets, which are dead ends, and not from the main street. The advantage of that is that the side street becomes a, a kind of protected area for the houses. If you've ever been in a traditional town, uh, in uh, one of these places in the Middle East, for instance, or in parts of Asia, or sometimes in Africa, you will find if you go down the side street that the householders come out and stop you and say, what are you doing here? What right have you got to be in this street? It's the, the protective mechanism of a side street. <coughs> and there you see how the houses can be clustered to be entered from the end of the dead end street. Now, moving on 3,000 years to uh, 3,000 and a half years, to the beginning of Islam, we begin. We have descriptions of early Islamic towns, and they, the description involves three major elements which are, are mentioned, and these are the ones picked up by Ibn Khaldun in the 14th century when he wrote his first sociological study. And that is a, a, a town or a city of any importance has to have a defensive outer wall or, or ditch or barricade of some kind. It has to have a religious building. You can see it here indicated with a minaret. And it has to have a ruler's abode and the abode of administration, the castle. <coughs> now in the uh, 20th century, scholars were able to identify that some parts of the world 
were very traditional. One of the most traditional parts was Arabia Felix, the south of Arabia. And the reason it was so traditional is that they had effectively stopped foreigners coming in for 260 years. <clears throat> and so it had, didn't have any foreign influence to speak of, very, very little. A few doctors had been allowed in, a few nurses, nothing else, no trains, no radio, uh, amazingly old-fashioned. <clears throat> and so in the uh, period when I first started to work on, on the Middle East uh, seriously, um, Cambridge University initiated the idea of an international expedition to study this ancient traditional way of life. And I was part of that, I was the architect. And here we are looking at a town, a city, somewhat in the news these days, Sana in Yemen, which was a traditional city that had effectively not been altered for 300 or 400 years. It really goes back to uh, prehistory. <clears throat> so that's what it looked like when we went there, this Cambridge expedition. It was a multidisciplinary expedition, expedition with uh, people from Vienna and Germany and France taking part as well. Uh, and here we see the, the sort of early photographs taken in 1972, this was, <clears throat> and this is from the other side of the city, looking at the citadel, the fortress, looking down and over, overlooking the city and controlling it. And you see the fortification all the way around. That sort of fortification, although this is another town, but it's that kind of fortification. And there you see from the air, taken a year later, the fortified f control of the town, the royal palace and its own private mosque looking uh, separated from the town so that it's really defensible. Even if the townspeople rose up in revolt, the uh, control uh, and the ruler's palace are protected. Although a few buildings were built by then outside the town, if you, you can see the wall if you look carefully. I'll show you, there it is. Here you are from inside the town, from a high building, looking at the same projection of the castle of the ruler. Now this is going to another of similar city. This is Cairo in Egypt. And this is the entrance to the ruler's palace. Fortified entrance. The entrance to the ruler's palace in Sana was much earlier. I would say 500 years earlier at least. We can't date it for sure yet. But uh, this is a uh, it was originally built in stone, as you, as you can see, with uh, large ashlar corners uh, and a, a great pair of gates, and it was a bent entrance. It's no longer used, which is why it looks so decrepit. And there's the bent entrance to it, very typical of that kind of approach. And here are the walls of the town itself. When I say that that gate and the walls are much earlier, we can date them back to the 800 AD period. Probably the gate is earlier than that, more likely to be 700 AD. I should perhaps just go explain for a moment there was water in the foreground. That is due to the fact that the, uh, this area is exposed to the monsoon twice a year. And the monsoon falls very heavily for 10 days. We know a bit like what that's like from the pretty recent cyclones in Brisbane. Uh, and so you get tremendous flooding for a few days, and that's when that photograph was taken. I'm sorry it's such a pale drawing, but this is a very detailed study of the old city, uh, made at about the time that we were there, uh, a little after, uh, as a, uh, an analyzing force, uh, made by the United Nations to try and understand the way in which the city worked. Uh, and there, in, over there is the fortress. And here is the wall we were looking at. Here are some of these buildings built outside. The wall goes around here. Originally, the wall went there along the edge of the wadi, and then it was extended in the 11th century to go around there. 
So that was the site of the city. Well, from the early descriptions of Islamic cities and from Ibn Khaldun, we know the most important uh, element was the religious building. And here is the great mosque of Sama, which my team are at the moment trying to conserve if the hostilities uh, ease up a bit. <coughs> and this was built uh, during the lifetime of the Prophet, around 630 AD, and has been a little bit altered since. Now, beyond the, the mosque, and not far away from it, very close to it, because of the need for the people to be able to get quickly to the mosque, is the market. So here is the mosque. It had this building in the middle erected as a treasury to keep uh, valuable records of the town and also old pieces of the Koran that were being thrown away. So this is a very important element, this treasury in the middle. And two minarets, uh, deliberately because uh, the number of minarets in the, indicates the importance of a mosque. So not very many have two. Uh, of course, Mecca has four. We're looking here at the uh, extensions of the mosque. So we're not seeing very early arcading, but the main hall where, where, where this photograph is taken from above the main hall is very early Byzantine arches. The outside wall is, if you know anything about the history of construction, is Ethiopian uh, construction. It's uh, the Aksumite kind of construction, the kind that was introduced w when the Ethiopians were ruling this area in the 6th century AD, uh, a century before these walls were built. Sometimes into the walls they inserted later arches with lights on either side, but these are the recesses for lights. Uh, it may be a good point to point out that this is the way a drain worked down the wall. It worked on the outside and was re-whitewashed every six months. So it could take a great volume of water coming off the roof. And that was the same way that a drain worked from a bathroom. At the bottom there was, a, of course, a a sink and into the sink. The sink then led into an underground cistern for the water. Now there is the mosque uh, and here very close to it is the market. In fact the market really begins here but these are all craftsmen's markets for making iron and wood products. And that's what the market looks like from above. And this is from street level. This is not far from the mosque. Now, of course, it can get very hot, and so there are shading devices introduced by the various shopholders. Each shop is very tiny, some of them very, very tiny, no more than cupboards. But each one has a, a safe and a hubbly bubbly and uh, various ways of uh, uh, controlling uh, thieves. But the main way to control thieves was to not allow anybody to wear weapons in the market. That was forbidden. You see how small they are. Here, here are people making daggers from scratch in this tiny space. Or, as happens in our, with our shops, the uh, goods can be overflown into the, into the street and you have stalls like this selling grain. Finally, you don't have to have a shop at all. You can come in as a, a farmer and sell your goods in the street. Of course, when you're working with metal, but with, particularly with iron and steel and copper, you need to be a uh, have some very hot furnaces and a lot of noise and fumes and so that happens at the edge of the market and not in the centre. You also people, you see people dressed up for the afternoon siesta where they're going to visit an important house and relax. And of course women are veiled but not completely. You can see their eyes. Now one important aspect of the market is a 
tradition of charity. And the charity takes a number of forms. I, I should say that the organization of a market is done with a sheikh. He, a man who is appointed to be in, or elected to be in control of the whole market. And his, he makes decisions with, in consultation with the elders of the market. <coughs> and they make sure that charity is pursued in every direction. And here is the charity for the animals, the, the uh, animals of burden that carry all the goods in and out of the market. Uh, they are provided with free food. And this free food is available to them uh, even when they are too old to work, until they die naturally. And so one of these small open spaces in the market is dedicated to providing animals with food at the expense of the market. Of course, many of the, of the pack animals are actually housed in caravanserais around the edge of the market. Uh, and uh, looked after there. Uh, sometimes the caravanserais are uh, built up so there are a lot of storerooms around them going up three or four floors and at the top there's an inn to look after the travelers, uh, the traders and the uh, people who are dri driving the caravans and they have their own bath up there and their own little mosque and in fact, this is a double caravanserai. You've seen the outside of it now, you've seen a model of it. And you see all the storerooms around the center, and the center is the stables. And above, these are the, this is the hotel. Two, two separate hotels here. And there you see it in section and plan. <coughs> Amazing building. And this is what it's like inside. And those are the storerooms around the outside. Now, of course, deserted, no longer used. But of course, if you were a, a member of the upper class, you might not want to stay in such a, a low kind of hotel. And so they provided better accommodation for visitors. So here is an upmarket hotel, near, right near the center of the market, uh, right at the edge of the market. Uh, and it has a, not one, but three restaurants in it, of varying quality. And it has a cafe on the outside edge. And we're looking at the entrance to the cafe. You notice the women carrying loads on their heads. So here is the cafe with men sitting around sipping and smoking. And if you go past through the cafe, you come to the restaurants. And here they are. And it's not at all unlike our cafes. Of course, you can trace all these things back to ancient Pompeii. And you can see the link to the ancient Romans and the ancient Hellenistic civilization. When you go to the courtyard, and the restaurants are in these courtyards, here upstairs, you can see, if you think about it, there's sort of resemblance to an, what we know of as an Elizabethan hotel, where you have arcades in courtyard, around the courtyard, do you remember? The ones in which Shakespeare's plays were first, first performed in the courtyards. So here you have the arcading around the courtyards. There's a little courtyard at the back for animals, and then the main courtyard is, is used for the entrance to the restaurants. And you go upstairs to sleep in the private room. I stayed in this hotel once for two weeks, just for fun. It was great, it was a great experience. So here we are in the, in the actual cor corridor. Not at all unlike our hotels, except a bit more basic. There's another kind of building around the market, and that is the building which houses a mill for grinding salt or grain or any other um, grinding, any other uh, milling activity you w would like to have. There are something like 30 different types of grain grown in Arabia Felix. And so there's an awful lot of variation in milling going on. And of course, the power comes from camels. Uh, in order to stop the camels getting dizzy as they go round and round, they wear blinkers. And that's a plan and section of a, a mill, which are two millstones, 
and two lots of camels working. And the room on the left, this one, is the stable for the camels. There's one other kind of building that's very important, and that is the watchtower. You can imagine that the goods in a market can be very valuable, particularly, of course, the gold and the silver, some of the metals, and some of the grains, too, are very valuable. And so they need to police them. And the policing is done with watchtowers, one here, one there, you can see them. And here's the control center for the watchtowers, rebuilt, obviously, in the last 100 years. So there you are looking at a watchtower from below. Actually, no one is allowed in the market after dark, theoretically. <coughs> also, the buildings in the market do not go up more than one level. Did you notice that? The market are all single-story buildings. That's to stop people living in the market area. They can live around the edge of it, but not inside it. The big buildings that do go up are, of course, caravanserais. <coughs> around the edge, you, get, you do get the beginning of higher buildings. And these higher buildings are part of the charity of the, of the market. These are rooms to be lent free for use by two categories of people. Widows and their children and students. Widows who have no income can live free at the expense of the market with their children. And, of course, the people in the market will give them food too. And students can also live free. There are something like 300 rooms like that around the market in Sana. And all done at the expense of the market. Now, some goods are not sold in the market. And they are two basic types. Things which are inflammable are not sold in the market. So wood is, for instance, sold at the gates of the city, but not inside the market. <coughs> and here you see camels bringing wood to one of the gates, and we're outside the city. The other thing that is not sold in the market is something which is uh, odorous and unpleasant to smell. And so fish and meat are not sold in the market. They're sold at the gates. Now, there's one activity which is not in the city at all and that is the communal prayer for the great festivals of the Muslim year. That communal prayer, as I've told you earlier, takes place in an open air space outside the city called the Musala. I showed you that one before in another photograph. And here is the Musala in use in Sana, as I said, outside of the main wall of the city. <coughs> this is the dawn prayer for one of the Eid, and you notice this is the Qibla wall because there is the prayer niche. What you might notice also is the number of police and army. There's the Qibla, and we're at the opposite side at the entrance. There is the police and the army. <coughs> this uh, particular musala holds about 3,000 people. And that's why the police and the army are there. These are the vehicles parked outside, <coughs> and they are, belong to various tribal sheikhs. And you see they've all come armed. Because, of course, tribes have hostilities going back hundreds of years. And these hostilities uh, could be, uh, come to the surface and cause trouble during this communal prayer. And so they make sure that they can defend themselves if anything happens. And that's why the army and the and police are in force. <clears throat> now, I've already shown you the houses, but I just remind you that the houses are tower houses because the, the, the site is so valuable, it's agricultural land. They crowd it in together, and you tend to have animals at the bottom. Uh, a, this is a small house, so it has a reception room above with mills behind. And then you start getting private rooms for the family above that. At the top, sometimes an entertaining room. Here's some bigger, some bigger ones. <coughs> Stone at the bottom, brick above. Of course, the, wherever they need to, they protect the decoration, which plaster decoration, with whitewash. Here's a very large one. And you went up the staircase around that central tower 
that central pier I told you about, which is the strongest part of the house. <coughs> and that means that the flights are very short and you have a series of square landings which make climbing through the house very easy. Water, in most houses, water is carried in, uh, in goatskins, uh, up to the upper levels where the kitchen is. But in the very valuable, very wealthy houses, the well goes up inside the house to the top. Main reception room for the, for the clan, for the huge extended family, and this is where people would uh, celebrate uh, births, betrothals, and where people who are dying would be laid out. Private room with uh, alabaster windows, having a meal here. And of course the view from the top when they have these entertainments in the siesta afternoon period. And they look out into this wonderful view. <coughs> now, I'm sorry it's so faint, but that's already I've already shown you that uh, plastered surface on the outside wall with a drain at the bottom leading to a cistern through a French drain. Uh, and it's coming from the bathroom. So the solid waste, uh, sorry about this, the solid waste falls down there to a room, a small room at the bottom, and is cleared out twice a week. Uh, and the, the urine is washed with water from standing on a central column here, a central uh, stone, the urine is washed by water down and out of the house. So where does the water come from? Well, there is water underground, and so there is a system, a series of ways of bringing water up. If you're bringing water for domestic use in large quantities, or for any kind of manufacturing use, then it is brought up using animals. <coughs> and of course there's a sloping ramp away from the well to make it easier for them. <coughs> and then the water is carried to a disposal point in the town, of which there are many, called a beer, and there are usually two back to back. One is for humans and the other is for animals. Two different uh, pools. <coughs> Where does the water come from in the first place? Well, of course, they collect a lot of water in the mountains, in great systems like this. And then they can send it down into the city using underground, uh, what we would call aqueducts, but actually they're rails, they're underground channels. And the reason they're underground is to cut down on the evaporation. <coughs> now that was not a very big city, and I wanted to take you to one which is also very well preserved and is a much larger city, and that is Fez in Morocco. And the difference too is that Fez is on hills, and so we don't have such an easy uh, way of studying the plan. We have to deal with the problem of very steep sloping sites, Fez. Still on the outside wall, but here's an idea of the density of it all. And the water runs down under the streets. Now, going back to Arabia Felix, to South Arabia, and looking at these ancient towns from above, one is immediately struck by the fact that even though the very center may be fairly dense, as soon as you get away from the center, you get these extraordinary pockets in the density, openings. If you study them in detail, that's what they look like, these openings. And why are they there? Here's an archaeological study uh, of a town that was deserted in the 14th century. <coughs> and this is, these are therefore very early houses. <coughs> and you notice that they are in two areas. There's an area there and an area here, and they're separated with a religious building between them. What is this area separating them for? Well, one explanation is that it's for building materials. Of course, you do need, if you're going to build in the local materials, you do need a place to get the materials from. But that's actually the secondary reason for it. <coughs> the primary reason, <coughs> and you see them in, in, Yemen, in, in Sana. Here is the city of Sana. 
Here's the, the castle. Here's the uh, mosque and the market. Here is the rail, the, I'm sorry, the um, wadi running through it. <coughs> but if you look carefully, you'll see that there are these holes all the way through the town, just like the holes we saw from the aerial photographs. And here's what they look like. <coughs> they're gardens. <coughs> Today, they're market gardens. But why are they there at all? We've got a mosque at the end, uh, we've got high houses around, and suddenly we've got this garden in the middle of the town. And we've not got one of them, we've got dozens of them. Why? Can anybody explain why? <coughs> Apart from the building materials, which is a good reason, but it's not the main reason. Yeah? Having some sense of self-sustainability and having closed city gates. Uh, it's getting you very, very, very close to the answer, yes. <coughs> it means that the town is divided up into neighbourhoods. <coughs> and the neighbourhoods are separated from each other. Why would that be necessary? Why would you separate the neighbourhoods from each other so clearly with such a space? Well, the answer may be clear if you think back to the communal prayer at the Musala and the fact that the sheikhs who came from the tribes brought their guns with them. There were a lot of traditional hostilities between tribes and clans in traditional societies, weren't there? They would carry these hostilities for hundreds of years. <coughs> and so if each neighborhood represents a clan or a tribe living together, mutually protecting them, themselves, <coughs> so they have to space themselves away from the next tribe or the next clan, don't they? To get more security, to get some safety. <coughs> and so that's how it worked. The way the town developed, once you get from away from the market, was as a series of separate arms. Each arm developed uh, for a clan or a tribe, and usually named after that clan or that tribe. Uh, today, we can tend to call them quarters. We call them the quarters of the town, but it's a modern name. Now, that means in the center of each of these clan areas, or tribal areas, there is a main street. And then there are side streets off to give you more security. <coughs> There's also usually one mosque, at least one, for each of these neighborhoods. <coughs> but there's also, there are also other buildings necessary. <coughs> for instance, if you collect the solid waste from the building uh, twice a week, where do you take the solid waste? Well, you could say you take it to, the, to these market gardens and use it as fertilizer. Not hygienic, not safe. What do you do? You actually take it to a place where it can be burnt. <coughs> and then when the ash is used for fertilizer. Well, what better place for burning the fuel <coughs> than in a public bath? You can heat the water, can't you? Using human waste, burning human waste heat the water, create a wonderful public bath, and then use the ash for fertilizer. <coughs> and so every one of these quarters has its own public bath, at least one. Ideally two. <coughs> if there are two, one can be open for men while the other is open for women. <coughs> so ideally a quarter would have at least one mosque and at least two baths. <coughs> and then the market gardens would be let out, uh, rented. Usually what happens is that the mosque authority, uh, which is centralized in the city, takes control of all these gardens and lets them out. <coughs> and the way the rent works is the, uh, the farmers can take ha half of the produce for themselves as their profit, and they have to give the other half back as rent. So here we are on the roof of one of these baths, and the staff 
uh, their job is to go out and gather the solid waste from the houses, bring it in and burn it for the heating of the bath. So the only really dense part of a, an Islamic town of this type is in the center. And after that, it opens up into all these open spaces all over the place, <coughs> uh, with the quarters effectively radiating out away from the center. But I call it an Islamic pattern, but actually, of course, it's an Asian pattern. It goes back long before Islam. It's the pattern of the, the way in which all the early urban developments took place, because tribalism was such an important part of early development of human beings. We all, all our ancestors belonged to tribes originally. <coughs> now, I want to look at how the quarters worked. Here we are looking at Fez from the air. <coughs> and it all, all looks absolutely chaotic. But actually, if you go in and look in the detail, the way it works in detail, and this is actually Baghdad, you notice that there is a sort of pattern to it all. Here is the main street leading from outside the town through the gate to the mosque. And another street continues and goes out to the outside that way. On this side, we have a street that takes you in to the mosque and then takes you out again. <coughs> There's a branch from here that takes you that way out. Those are the main streets. <coughs> and you would call them the primary streets of an Islamic town or any traditional Asian town, the primary streets. <coughs> now, they would not normally have the quarters along them. Normally, the quarter would be at right angles to them. So here is a typical quarter. It has a main central street. And on that main central street will be the entrance to the mosque and the bars. And then of the main central street, are all these dead-end streets. Here's another one, the dead-end streets of it. And so they go on. <coughs> these are quarters. These are the neighborhoods. And the main street of a neighborhood is the secondary type of street. And of course, the dead-end street is the third type of street. So we have primary, secondary, and tertiary streets in any traditional town. Here we are going back 3000 BC, and you can see we've got it. <coughs> this is obviously a, uh, it seems to be a primary street going through. It may be a secondary street. <coughs> uh, we don't have very many examples of side streets off here, but this is a secondary street, which as time developed, might have developed uh, tertiary streets. So the, the principle goes back to the earliest settlements, the earliest cities of man. And of course, the tertiary street ha is the private street, sometimes with a gate at the end of it. And in the days when curfew was sounded, and it, it still was sounded in, in Sana when I first went to study it, at 8 o'clock in the evening, all movement stopped in the city. Everybody went behind their gates. And the doors of these tertiary streets were locked. And nobody could move from 8 in the evening until 6 in the morning. Well, now here is just to give you an idea. Uh, this is one of these archaeological sites. <coughs> and here's the way people got in to the houses. Here is a, a main open space, this is primary space, secondary spaces, tertiary spaces coming off it. Here's a, uh, uh, tertiary, definitely, and all the houses coming off. And when you look at the detail plan, that's what it looks like. The houses facing in all sorts of directions, depending on how they're entered. So here we are in Egypt, in Cairo, and this is a typical, these are the two primary streets running north-south. If any of you know Cairo, you'll remember them. <coughs> they go from the south gates to the north gates. And between them, you get the quarters. One type of quarter, of course, the other quarters over here. But here's a typical quarter with a secondary street and tertiary streets. 
And here we are in Fizz, looking at a primary street. These are the primary streets in Fizz run down the slopes of the hills. And they all go down to the bottom, and the main market of Fizz is at the bottom of the hill, and next to the great mosques. Uh, now that means that the neighborhoods are on the contour, at right angles to the main streets. We're still looking at a main street. The water supply for Fizz is underneath the main street. Here we are at a side street, so this is a quarter, and it's more or less horizontal. <coughs> and there are sometimes a small openings, small doors in the walls, which allow you to go down to look at the uh, water supply underneath, which is always uh, a man's height, so you can stand up in it. Here in Cairo, a typical quarter main street off the main north-south uh, road. And so here is a street. Here's the secondary street running on the contour. And that gives you an idea how dense they are. Amazing, eh? So these are two quarters. Now you may say, what's happened to the open space between the quarters? Well, the truth is they couldn't keep it up because the towns got so dense, so prosperous, so heavily occupied, they couldn't maintain the open spaces. So they allowed them to be built over. But what did happen was that a wall was usually built along here between the houses. And that high wall was an absolutely without any opening at all. And it kept the, separate, the quarters separate from each other. So here we have a tertiary street in Bahrain. And here we have a very rare ex example of a public street which has open space associated with it because of the tree. This is in Fez. In actual fact, an important point about Asian cities and Islamic cities, traditionally, is there are no public spaces. There's no need for them. There was no public uh, assembly allowed. There was no uh, public debate. Everything was, was, came down from above uh, in a hierarchical system. Here we are in Fez, looking along one of the uh, quarters main street. That's, of course, a secondary street. And here, of course, when you get into the mountainous areas of places like Morocco, you often get some of the tertiary streets are stepped. And some of the tertiary streets can be very narrow. This is Cairo. <coughs> well, there are a lot of other building types that are associated with quarters and with the main streets. <coughs> and, of course, we've already looked at this one. This is the uh, college of a university. There's different buildings, in, both in Fez and, Mar and in Marrakesh. Very characteristic. You get them in many of the Syrian towns as well, although they've probably been damaged by the fighting. <coughs> but also you get hospitals, of course. And so uh, many of the quarters have clinics associated with them, either small clinics or quite large hospitals. And they would have the only open space, and one of the few open spaces in a quarter would be in the courtyard of the hospital. <coughs> and the courtyard, the hospital would frequently have uh, wards which had open space in the center, a sort of courtyard in the center. Now, this is a very fascinating building <coughs> because you would not think that uh, it, traditional uh, Asian cities had blocks of flats, but they did. <coughs> and these were very influential on modern architecture. <coughs> this is a typical building containing blocks of flats in Cairo, but, there, but it's one, there are um, um, uh, buildings of this kind all over the Middle East. <coughs> and what they are is they are rather upper class uh, groupings of uh, craftsmen and uh, dwellings above. So let us take the, the, the richest kind of craftsmen and start from them, and you can see how it would work. Let's take the jewelers and the goldsmiths and the silversmiths. <coughs> now, they would work 
in such a, a, a complex, the uh, lowest level would be the shop in which they would have some of their top craftsmen working and then they would have some of the junior craftsmen working upstairs in the attic. And the, so the two lowest levels of this complex <coughs> are for those craftsmen to work. <coughs> but because they are fairly wealthy, they don't want to live very far away from where they work, so their apartments are above their shop. <coughs> The form the apartment takes is that it has a double story room which is the main living room. It's very grand. In my section I've actually made it a bit small. Oh, don't take it away, Pedro. Leave it there, there like that. Can you see it? From, can you all see it from there? <coughs> this perhaps is a, it's been truncated, it should be wider. But this is the double story room. Very grand, <coughs> and that's their main room of their home. Behind it, <coughs> there's the entrance lobby, which has some rooms off it, a bathroom and a kitchen. And then above is the main sleeping area for the family. <coughs> and of course, you can see the, what it's a precedent for, can't you? The Unité d'Habitation of Corbusier who was fascinated by it when he saw it and sketched it a lot. <coughs> if they're very wealthy, they could have another room above. So this becomes the, room, the bedroom for the children, and the main bedroom is above. And so you see it in the elevation here. The main bedroom, the main room of the house, and the web room below. <coughs> so that's a vertical, uh, very characteristic vertical uh, use of space in such a rich complex. <coughs> but, uh, needless to say, there, there grew a demand for apartment buildings. And so uh, the number of these complexes was increased uh, and you started to get all sorts of crafts working at the lower level and lots of people who didn't own craft shops renting the apartments above. <coughs> Indeed, they got so prolific that sometimes you would get uh, secondary and third tertiary courtyards with apartments facing outwards into the town <coughs> and becoming more and more like our concept of a, of a dwelling apartment. <coughs> <coughs> now, if you weren't rich enough to have such a complex as that, then you might live in a one room or a two room uh, flat. And there were lots of uh, big buildings in the in bigger cities which accommodated people on that level. So you could get five or six floors of one room or two room apartments. So it's surprising to think that that was happening over a thousand years ago in these Asian towns. Now, as you may know, the street level in any town, unless it's very, very carefully cleaned, tends to rise naturally with time. Partly through repaving, partly through lack of cleaning properly. And so archaeologists tend to accept that in any archaeological site, a, a distance of about 12 inches, it represents a century in a street, in a main street. So here you are looking at a building which is, uh, it's about six feet down, isn't it? So it's about 600 years ago, and that's about right. This main, the main entrance to this building. It's a 600-year-old public bath in Cairo. <coughs> and uh, you see it has a very grand entrance because nearly always these were charitable works given by some rich family to the community. <coughs> Why does it have a cloth hanging uh, crookedly across the entrance? Does anybody know? Anybody? That's amazing. It means it's woman's day, a woman's hour. <coughs> it's the signal to the men that they can't come in. <coughs> if it's not there, then it's men's time. <coughs> we go in and we enter the main hall of the bath 
The main hall of the bathroom have changing rooms around it, which are changing spaces. They're not private rooms. Changing spaces, which always have straw mats. The great advantage of a straw mat is that as it becomes wet, you can just take it away and put fresh ones in. <coughs> and then uh, you can see the ba bathers are waiting for trade. These are professional bathers. Uh, maybe one or two of them are also people having a bath. And they're sitting on the edge of a pool which has a fountain in it. You see the jet of the fountain going up? <coughs> and of course there's quite a lot of good top light, which is this vertical streams of light you see coming in. So that's what a bath is like. This is the main room on the right. And then <coughs> behind it you enter the bath proper. So you change here and you put your clothes into those niches there. <coughs> and then you go in to the main bath. The main bath has medium temperature rooms, tepidariums, and then it has hot rooms, calidarium, at the back. <coughs> and you can see why they're hot, because here's the furnace and the fumes, the heat going in underneath the hypercost. So there's the, the actual drum of water. <coughs> and the heat goes through under there from the fire. The fire is here. And it also goes up the side walls. So the hottest room is this one. That's medium hot. This is the tepidarium here. Now the ancient baths are very, often have very small rooms because they, the cost of constructing it. And these are very ancient. These are pre-Islamic. This bath is, is thought by everybody to be pre-Islamic. It doesn't have very large rooms. It's Hellenistic type. And of course, the tradition of public baths goes back to ancient Greece and Rome. <coughs> so here, in this case, is the changing room. And you go through here into the tepidarium, and that's the calidarium. And then you see the domes over the top to let the, keep the heat in and let the light in. So here is the typical tepidarium area, where the the bathers have gone into the calidarium and perspired to get the dirt out of the skins, the pores of their skin, and they now now come back into the tepidarium to be bathed, to be cleaned. <coughs> this is a typical Turkish type bath. You get them through all the Middle East. And each bather tends to have an attendant provided by the bath who would scrape the sweat off the skin after the sweating. With, salt, with, with soap and wash the, wash the bather. <coughs> um, if you are fussy about having a stranger do that, then you bring one of your own family, usually one of your children, to do it for you. <coughs> Here in that section, the big section I showed you, is the main entrance room. Here we are up on the platform for uh, changing. The reason for the platform is so that they could warm it in winter. They put hot coals underneath in winter to keep it warm. Uh, and these are the niches in the wall for the clothing. This is empty, but this is the pool which should have a fountain in it uh, for washing your clothing in after you bathe. The way the light comes in through the domes. And here we are in the calendarium. Now in the calendarium it is usually so hot that you can't even sit. You have to, it takes you 10 minutes to get used to it and be able to even sit. <coughs> Um, it is so hot that people tend to keep moving in it, which is good, of course, because you first buy more. And there, there, there tend to be traditional dances or, or acrobatics that you do in the calendarium to increase the perspiration, get it out of your skin. People who are very fussy about being clean will go into the calendarium twice. Uh, they'll have, having been soaked and washed once in the tepidarium, they'll go back in a second time and get perspiration all over again and get really clean. So there's a detail of how the fire works with the, with the uh, some sort of a system above. And here are the heat fumes going up the side walls and out through the roof. Here's an attendant uh, next to a very ancient stone pool, uh, two, two in the corner here. <coughs> and he, this is in that bath that is thought to be pre-Islamic in Sana. And here we are in what is normally called the dark room. <laughs> because in, in, at the edges of the calendarium they would usually have two dark rooms, one or two dark rooms, to allow people to go in and wash their private parts if they wish to. When you come out, 
you, you, are ama you are amazingly hot. You've been exposed for an, perhaps an hour to these high temperatures. And so you cannot just go out into the open, particularly in winter. And so there's a tradition that you wrap yourself up in towels, which are provided by the establishment, uh, even your head, and you sit for an hour before you go out. You know, the history is full of stories of people, soldiers who had to go out quickly and caught pneumonia and died. <clears throat> so you normally stay inside for an hour. So you're sitting in the, in the changing room, and what can you do? Well, they provide you with sherbet, coffee, and music. And there's nearly always an orchestra provided by the establishment, uh, good guitarists and singers. And you sit and talk to your friends. It's a great experience. <clears throat> and of course, the attendants wash your clothes at the same time. And here is the back of that big bath. And this is the way down to the fifth furnace and the heating system. And that's where the, uh, where the fuel, the human waste which has been dried and is now going to be burnt, is taken to be the fuel. Now, what I've done is I've shown you the ancient form of urban development, and as it still survives in many parts of the Middle East and in Asia. <clears throat> but now we come in the next lecture to another question, and that is, what happens if a ruler decides to embellish the city, to make it a grander city, or even to build a new city which is designed entirely to be grand? What sort of city would be designed? So we're going to look next week at designed cities, uh, as opposed to cities which evolved naturally. <coughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Because it impressed me immensely when I first went. <coughs> I went in uh, behind some rather dragged looking people, and uh, I noticed that when the, 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 at the entrance, when you go into the big changing room, there's always the bath keeper is there, the, usually the bath owner. Uh, and he sits next to the podium on which the musicians play. <coughs> and the, this bath owner, Hamami he's called, he uh, took from these people in front of me two tiny little coins. Then when I came along, he said, I asked him how much, and he said the equivalent of five dollars. <coughs> I was a bit shocked anyway. I gave him the five dollars because I wanted to go in. <coughs> and I then asked my friends inside, uh, and people I met and talked to, what, why there was, seemed to be a different disparity in charge. And he said, oh, well, poor people aren't charged anything. People who've got a little bit of money are charged a modicum. You're charged according to what the Hamami thinks you can afford to pay. You can dispute it, but normally he's, his word goes. And rich people pay a lot of money. Amazing, eh? And that's how they keep the system going. Any other questions? <clears throat> Very socially aware society in the Middle East. Yeah. Ah, now that's a very good question too. <clears throat> Normally you have to be very clean to pray. The most important prayer is Friday in the Muslim communities. So you would normally expect the whole community to want to go to the bath on Thursdays or Friday morning. And they do. An awful lot of people do. <clears throat> what about the rest of the week? Well, people who can afford to or enjoy it go quite often. And I would say that most people would go two or three times a week if they could. But when people are retired, they really love it, so they go every day. <laughs> <coughs> Any other question? It's a great social gathering point, the public bars. <coughs> great, thank you.